Good morning. I'm Colin D, a regular uh, meeting of the equity and public and private committee for the Board of Investment today being Wednesday, May 19th, and it is uh, 8 a.m. Before we proceed, uh, Melissa, would you uh, please um, read the instructions out? Yes, thank you, Mr. Santos. This meeting is being conducted as a virtual meeting. I would do a roll call of the trustee to confirm attendance. Mr. Kehoe? I'll come back to you. Uh, Ms. Green? Hello, good morning. Oh, is that you, Mr. Green? Yes, I'm here. Good morning. I'll, just, I'll mark you in now. Um, Mr. Jones? Yes. Chair Santos? Present. Mr. Bernstein? Here. Mr. Kelly? I'll come back to you. Ms. Sanchez? Here. Okay, um, let's go back to Mr. Kehoe. Ms. Greenwood? Mr. Kelly? I'm present. Did I hear Mr. Oh, okay, I see you, Mr. Kelly. Yeah, can you hear me? Staff participating in today's meeting include Principal Investment Officer, Ted Wright, Chris Wagner, Principal Invest Investment Officer, Ron Sankawa, Senior Investment Analyst, Jeff Gia, Kelvin Chang. Consultant participating in the meeting include Makita Investment Group, Tim Fella, Alina Yoon, Trustees, if you have a comment or questions on any item, please use the Zoom op chat option to be placed in the queue. At this time, we ask all meeting participants to mute their mics until you are ready to speak. And now we may proceed with the agenda. Great, thank you very much, Melissa. Uh, I'm not quite sure we have a quorum. Uh, so we have Mr. Green who will be voting. Uh, we still, is Mr. Okum here today at this meeting? Um, Mr. Jones is actually uh, replacing Mr. Okum. So Mr. Okum is no longer on the board. Yeah. Oh, that's right. I forgot. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Good morning, Mr. Jones. <laughs> All right. So do, we do have a quorum then with Mr. Uh, Green, uh, a voting member. Uh, having said that, I will entertain um, a motion to approve the minutes of uh, March 10th. I move. Has been moved. I will second that. Any changes, revisions? Uh, Mr. Kelly? Uh, you, I believe you unmute Mr. Kelly, but uh, if I remember correctly, I think Mr. Kelly has a correction on the minutes, and in particular, the spelling of Mr. Ocom's name. Uh, anything else that that um, you would like to have us change or correct, Mr. Kelly? No? Okay, so now another we need to fix Mr. Kelly's um, uh, connection. Uh, okay, so they're having, uh, with those changes, uh, would that be included in the, in the motion? I think it was Mr. Green who made the motion. Yes. Yes? yes. Okay. Uh, um, should I do the call, the roll call? Yes, please. Mr. Kehoe? I don't hear him. Mr. Kehoe? Mr. Jones? Aye. Uh, Mr. Green? Aye. Chair Santos? Aye. Okay, um, Mr. Kehoe? Okay, so the motion passes with three yes and one absentee. Great, thank you very much. Uh, next item on the, on the agenda is public comment. I don't believe we have received requests. Is that correct, uh, Melissa? 
That is correct, Chair Santos. Great, thank you very much. Moving forward, non-consent items. Uh, subsection eight, Mr. Mr. Wagner. Good morning, uh, Mr. Uh, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee and board members in attendance. Um, if you recall back in January, Ted Vachi and I reviewed the emerging manager programs uh, with, the, with the board and their particular status at that time. Um, specifically in private equity, we identified that the search for uh, a, uh, a, a, a provider of uh, private equity emerging manager services would, would begin in 2021. Now, while the commitment for the current phase of the program has been a bit lumpy over the past three years as a result of COVID and, and opportunities in the marketplace, the program has made progress. Um, currently, you know, the program represents approximately 5% of the private equity portfolio's net asset value and that is within the policy range of zero to 7%. You know, we do make a point in the memo that this next emerging manager mandate could put the program over the policy range the next year or so. However, depending on how the board proceeds later with the various strategic asset allocation options will impact that timing, especially if there is a larger allocation of private equity and a steadily increasing portfolio NAV. So, with that, um, I'll turn it over to Calvin, who will go through the evaluation process criteria and the MQs for the uh, for the proposed search. Calvin. Good morning, Mr. Chair and trustees. Uh, today's recommendation is to advance the private equity emerging manager discretionary separate account search request for proposal minimal qualifications to the Board of Investments for approval. Lacera has had a private equity emerging manager program since 2001. The goal of the program has been to cultivate general partner relationships and graduate them to the core private equity program. Staff managed the program internally and brought recommendations to the BOI for approval. But in 2007, a separately account managed uh, account structure was established uh, due to the growth of opportunities in the marketplace. JP Morgan was selected after a competitive RFP process to manage $150 million uh, in a discretionary allocation pool. Subsequently, there were three more allocations. The, and the last one, which was for $300 million, is projected to be fully utilized by the second quarter of next year. To continue with the program, staff is recommending the, a, the RFP mandate for $400 million that would be committed by the select a separate account manager across four years. On the next slide, uh, the eva evaluation, so the evaluation team will consist of three members of the investment team uh, that will assess the written RFP responses and to interview the most qualified firms. After the evaluations, the team's final recommendation will be submitted to the board. On slide four, the team will evaluate the responses uh, on six criteria, organization, professional staff, investment process, transparency and collaboration, performance and fees. The next slide uh, shows the proposed search timeline. Uh, this is, if this recommendation were to be approved by the equity committee and the board of investments, the RFP would be activated and posted. We're expecting about 30 to 40 responses to evaluate during the second phase of this process. As a reference point, there were uh, 29 responses received in the last completed RFP. We expect to conduct interviews with three to six semi-finalists and make a recommendation at the February BOI meeting. Slide six. Today, uh, we're seeking approval to move forward with the five minimum qualifications for the private equity emerging manager RFP. Consistent with Lacera's tight initiatives, uh, these criteria were brought in compared to the previous RFP to widen the opportunity set to a greater number of firms interested in this mandate. The first MQ requires an eight year verifiable track record committing to emerging managers. Longer periods will allow for assessment of separate account managers performance through a range of economic environments. The uh, second MQ requires the separate account manager have recent experience investing in emerging managers 
to committing at least $100 million in the past year. Next MQ seeks with a, a, the managers with at least five institutional clients. Mr. Chen, Mr. Chen, can I ask a question, quick question here? With regards to the um, minimum of 100 million uh, allocation, um, given the fact that we've been under COVID um, and perhaps some managers may, may, may not have been able to deploy uh, up to 100 million in the past 12 months. Is that something that we do? Do you think that we should be a little more flexible on that? What's your view on that? Well, uh, the, the, the power equity market actually has turned around quite a bit. Uh, in, in terms of pacing in the last uh, since around September. And so, uh, you know, by, you know, June or July, uh, you know, that would be almost a full year of, of you know, you would say normalcy. And so, uh, you know, it, 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 I believe it, it should be, this 100 million is, is a good number. And also, it, it's also uh, less than what we had in the prior uh, RFPs. I just concerned with the twelve months period. Um, so anyway, just just something to keep in mind. Yeah, we 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 could we could you know we could look into that as well and and be flexible on and the amount or the periods. All right, thank you. Yeah, Herman, we 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 moved that number from three hundred to one hundred, and and really the lumpiness in the market has been mostly in Europe. Uh, there's, uh, there's, there's still quite a few opportunities, as Calvin said, out there, uh, but really it's been in the U.S. and, 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 and uh, J.P. Morgan's a little behind in, in the allocation uh, that we set up for the international uh, criteria, uh, but I think uh, 100 million uh, is, 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 is really a small number and, and, and there should be plenty of, of groups that have, have had that experience. Okay. Thank you. So the uh, the third MQ is, is uh, you know requires we're seeking managers with at least five institutional clients, when two of them being public pension funds, and one being greater than ten million dollars. Our preference is for a firm to have a diversified clientele, and not be relying on a single client. Uh, also have the experiences working with public pension programs like ourselves, Lacera. The fourth MQ requires a firm to have at least $500 million of assets under management to ensure sufficient firm revenue to build up the operational scale. And the last MQ is, um, requires the firm to be a fiduciary to Lacera, establishing a duty of loyalty and duty of care. The last slide we'll cover is the summary uh, of scope of services for this RFP. The selected separate account manager is expected to identify and select high quality emerging managers. In addition to the hiring, the separate account manager will monitor the investments through the life of the fund and collaborate with Lacera on future initiatives, including graduating managers to the Lacera's core portfolio. So with that, that concludes our presentation. We'll open up for any comments and questions. Any questions, colleagues? Question. Let's, let's see, uh, Mr. Kelly. Thank you. So, Calvin, I had a question. Um, the math is not working for me. On page two, you say the current the program currently represents approximately five percent, three hundred seventy five million of the private equity portfolio. And then earlier, you say the total program six fifty. So, if we make this additional commitment, even without the six, even without this additional commitment, the six fifty is eight point nine percent. The math isn't working for me. Um, so um, I'm concerned about that because we're without the, without the commitment, we are, we are already over the 7% target according to the NAV. Well, the, the NAV is 300 right now, around 375. 75, right. Yeah. And so the fund, I believe, is above 8 billion. Uh, 7.5, 7 that works out to be. Mr. Kelly, uh, how it works is we we commit the money to J.P. Morgan or, whom, or whomever the manager would be. It's not drawn down. So uh, while the math 
may uh, uh, not work because you're, you're dividing the committed amount, not the invested amount or the net asset value into the net asset value of the entire program. So you get a much smaller percentage. Uh, so until that money becomes net assets, uh, it, we are not over the over the policy range if, if, if that if that clears it up for you. Okay, how much would we be if we if we commit to this? How much would we be over the policy range, assuming the funds were all committed and we, fund down? Oh, well, of course you have to build in the fact that the main program is going to grow over the next couple of years as well. So we would not it, once you commit the money, we are not over the range. Uh, the range will be whatever the NAV is of the program divided into the uh, portfolio's entire NAV. So um, it, actually the, the program has grown a billion dollars in the last quarter. And so, the, uh, so this program now represents only 4% of the NAV. So we have plenty of room to grow with respect to NAV, but we need to commit the money earlier so that they have it in order to commit to funds as they move out in, in the years. Okay, I got it. Thank you very much. Sure. Any other questions, comments? Um, I have a, another question, if I may. So um, where are we going to, or uh, how are we going to evaluate the um, manager, the, um, the manager's uh, DE&I policies and makeup of the workforce? That, that would be, uh, are you talking about the separate account manager or the funds that the separate account managers are investing in? Both. Okay, well, uh, I, I guess either way, we, we would be uh, you know, following our, our uh, standard process with ESG uh, and DE&I um, that we have for all of our managers and investment opportunities. So, uh, you know, we generally have uh, our, our diversity questionnaire, ESG questionnaire, uh, and, and the uh, surveys. And so uh, you know, we'll be collecting those data sets and evaluating them and discussing uh, with the managers directly if, if you know, anything comes about as well. So uh, uh, similar to any other report that we get that will include uh, a paragraph or two with regards to the due diligence uh, regarding the uh, ESG and uh, the ENI? Yes, it, it will be no less than uh, any other investment opportunity. Okay, good. Uh, Ms. Sanchez? Yes, I, so I had a question before you began, and I think you answered it, but I just want to double check. So for the minimum qualifications, you expect 30 to 40 firms meet the eight-year verifiable track record in emerging managers? We expect responses from 30 to 40. Uh, last time around, we had 29, and, and I believe 22 met all the uh, MQs. Okay, just curious. Thanks. Uh, Mr. Grable. Just to build on Calvin's answer, good morning, Mr. Chair, members of the committee, members of the board. We have, since 2018, in all RFPs, we've included a standard DDQ uh, for diversity, equity, inclusion. So that's standard across every RFP that we issue. Good. Thank you for that, Mr. Grable. Any other comments, questions? One more. Uh, Mr. Kelly. The, um... The um, requirements say that the firm must comply with um, GIPS. Um, we used to say, we used to give them 12 months to comply if they didn't. Um, and I'm just wondering why the change? Uh, we, we, we don't have a, a MQ for, for GIPS. It's number eight on the list. Oh, sorry, this is the next item, sorry. Yeah. This is the next item. Sorry. It's not applicable okay. to private equity. Yeah. Okay. Um, I will entertain a motion to recommend this matter to the Board of Investments. Mr. Jones, would you like to make the motion? <laughs> I don't want to put you in the spot, but you're the new guy, so we pick up the new guy. <laughs> yeah, I'd like to make a motion that we go ahead and recommend this uh, 
particular uh, proposal to the board. All right, and thank you, Mr. Jones. Uh, I need a second. Second. Okay, it's been moved and duly second. Um, I don't see any further requests to speak. Uh, roll call, please. Mr. Jones? Aye. Mr. Green? Aye. Chair Santos? Aye. The motion passes with the trustees present. Great, thank you very much. Uh, moving forward to subsection B, Mr. Wright. Good morning, Mr. Chair, members of the committee, members of the board. Can everybody hear me well? Yes, sir. Beautiful. Um, uh, back in February of last year, the board approved the new emerging manager policy. And with that, some of the key objectives were to make the policy more market aware, as well as to widen the opportunity set for participants. And part of that entailed tailoring each of the searches, the RFP searches to the prevailing manager universe at that time. Um, additionally, in November of 2020, staff presented a structure review um, to the committee and included in that were several initiatives, one of which was to continue to build out the Emerging Manager Program. Um, with that, my colleague Ron Sinkandu will talk you through the highlights of the current uh, proposal. Ron? Thank you, Ted. Good morning, Mr. Chair and members of the committee. Oh. Staff is recommending that the committee advance the minimum qualifications for the Global Equity Emerging Manager RFP to the board for approval. For today's presentation, we'll cover the background, the search overview, the evaluation process and criteria, the timeline, the minimum qualifications, and wrap up with the scope of services summary. Starting off with the background on slide two, in September 2017, the board approved transitioning the US only fund of funds emerging manager program into a direct investment program and expanded the program to include non US mandates. As a result, an RFP was issued for US and non US equity managers. The search was concluded in August 2018 with three managers hired two US small cap managers and one non US small cap manager. In February 2020, the board approved a new emerging manager policy. Like Ted mentioned earlier, one of the key objectives was to make the policy more market aware and to widen the opportunity set. Minimum qualifications will be determined by the universe prevailing at the time when the search is conducted. The allocation to emerging managers is 0.9%, which is within the board approved range of 0.5%. Moving on to the search overview slide, slide three. Staff is seeking approval for US, non-US, and Global Equity Emerging Managers RFP search with an aggregate mandate of up to 500 million and up to three managers may be selected depending upon the type of strategies proposed and received and the portfolio fit within the broader global equity portfolio. Our investment, investment manager database, approximately 40 managers were identified that met the proposed minimum qualifications. Consistent with the emerging manager policy, LACERA expect external managers and third party providers to reflect LACERA's tie towards inclusion, diversity, and equity initiative. Slide four, please. Slide four covers the evaluation process. The evaluation team will consist of a three member team, namely a principal investment officer, an investment officer, and a senior investment analyst. The search will be conducted in two phases. Phase one, the evaluation of the written RFP responses, and phase two, candidate interviews will be most likely conducted via video conference calls. The final scores, evaluation review, and recommendation will be advanced to the board, which has the selection authority for this RFP. Moving on to slide five, which highlights the evaluation criteria. RFP responses will be evaluated based on the following categories, in addition to portfolio fit within the overall global equity portfolio. Organization, 
professional staff, investment process, trading and operations, performance, and fees. A proposed timeline for the search is included on slide six. Manager recommendations will be made to the board at the December 2021 BRI meeting. The minimum qualifications or MQs are listed on, on slide number seven. I wanted to bring MQ number four and number seven to the committee's attention. For MQ number four, staff recommends limiting firm AUM at 3 billion. This is increased from prior limit of 2 billion. For MQ number seven, staff recommends changing the portfolio manager track record to at least three years. This is reduced from five years. Both these MQs are intended to broaden the manager universe. MQ number six is intended to capture managers with experience managing institutional products and to ensure that Lacera's capital does not represent a disproportionate amount of the product's assets. On slide eight, we have the summary of the scope of services to be provided. Managers will provide loan only US, non-US or global equity management services, monitor and report on investment in collaboration with the custodian and provide topical updates on market environment, investment themes and strategy as requested. Attachment number two provides additional details on the minimum qualification. Makita has reviewed staff's memo and concurred with staff's recommendation. Their memo is included as attachment number three. This concludes our prepared remarks. We're happy to answer any questions you may have at this time. Any questions, Mr. Kelly? Good morning. I was wondering why um, we used to allow a uh, firm to become GIPS compliant within the first 12 months. Um, and you're requiring it as a, as a condition of response here. And I'm just wondering why the difference, I'm fine with it. I'm just wondering why the change. Uh, yeah, Mr. Kai, to answer your question, we did require that prior, but we've had uh, issues uh, where uh, managers promised to comply within 12 months and they didn't. So, and also this is gonna be a global mandate and for emerging managers in terms of, we want to make sure that we can compare managers across regions and globes and making sure that everybody's getting a comparable comparison. All right. Have you found that the change um, has, 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 has uh, reduced the number of, of firms responding? No. Okay, thank you very much. Yeah, so I have a question. I don't see any other requests to speak. So I have a question in the meantime. So two questions actually. Um, the, the goal is to uh, conduct an emerging manager search every two years. So what is the staff doing and uh, to um, find those those managers? I mean, the, the, I'm kind of looking at a person costers. They have uh, a, a conference where they invite the emerging managers uh, to attend. And my understanding is that that's one way that they use to find um, those uh, emerging managers that will fit in the portfolio. So that will be one question. And the second question is, is, is 3 billion um, uh, sufficient? I thought that maybe we should go to uh, 5 billion. Uh, so I will, Definitely would like to hear from you on both uh, items. If I, can, if I can jump in. Yes, sir. Um, uh, great questions, Mr. Santos. I'm actually happy that you asked, especially the first one. Um, um, I guess we've done, in, in addition to these MQs, which Ron noted, just on the investment screens, we're looking at 40 plus qualified applicants. But of course, some firms may also have other products that will qualify. So that number will probably go up. If I can recall a couple of years ago when we did this search, we had, I wanna say 16 run that yes. qualified. So it's more than doubled. We'll, we'll probably get two and a half times, at least two and a half times to three more qualified applicants. Um, also, 
a lot of the initiatives that we've we've um, that we're working on will add, I think, to the number of um, to the exposure of emerging managers. So, with the um, with the advocacy program, for example, we're doing some DEI um, initiatives, and that will allow us to to um, at least the allow the introduction of a lot more firms to Lacera. Additionally, um, we keep an open line to managers and we have a process in place that's been there for, I wanna say at least five, six years where we, um, not only we um, respond to, to every manager query, we have a process where we screen and set up meetings with all um, all manager queries, as well as log them as we move forward. So um, we have a, an incredibly robust process to, to not only uh, see managers, but also to communicate them with them on a regular basis, the emerging managers. Um, on the second question with the 5 billion, uh, I think Ron noted that it used to be 2 billion before and we have it at three. Um, we, we think that's a, a sufficient number to get a broad, a wide pool of participants. If we were to go up to five, we would, we would hit some of our current managers who are in our core portfolio, who are probably not really emerging managers. Um, so I think from in aggregate, you know, great questions. Um, I think we, we are certainly, um, you know, at the top of our, of our game when it comes to making sure managers have access to us. Um, just, uh, Mr. Wright, just to follow up to your question. So, um, so currently we have well, several managers in the program, right? And one of them is GE. Uh, how, how are they performing at this point? So, sorry, which, which one? Sorry, I, your GE? voice. Do we have GE? The portfolio? No. No, we do not. Okay, never mind. Okay, I believe I have uh, Mr. Um, Leandro and then Mr. Grable. Thank you, Mr. Santos. Um, just for further perspective, Mikita does conduct two annual meetings where we invite emerging managers across all asset classes. A good number of those come from the public equity space. Um, in addition, we, as part of our day-to-day -day routine, we meet with all kinds of managers, including emerging and diverse managers. And whenever there is somebody that we think it's appropriate for Lacera, we forward that information to Ted and his team. And so from our perspective, we try to provide that deal flow in addition to whatever your staff may be doing on the run. So I just wanted to provide that, uh, that context as well as that, and, and that resource, make sure the board is aware we have that, we have that resource with Mikita. See, so um, whenever you have those conferences, if you can let uh, the board uh, know, because we might like to attend, some of my colleagues may like to attend. Mr. Sure, we can provide that information. The way it is set up is, is a meeting for um, emerging and diverse managers that have not had a meeting with Mikita, say, in the past two or three years. And so they can meet one-on-one uh, -on -one with our research team for about an hour or so. Um, and uh, we can make sure that your staff and the board is aware when those happens. The next one is likely to be scheduled in October. The last one just happened in April. Oh, so this is not a conference. This is just a one-on-one -on -one, uh, meeting. Right, with managers and, and our research staff. But we can let you know nonetheless so that you're aware of that. Yeah, I think perhaps to think about that, uh, working with the staff, to maybe it doesn't have to be a conference, but some avenue for some of those managers to uh, learn about a program. And uh, because if we're gonna be doing this every every two years, I think we need to figure out, which is quite frankly has been my concern when we decided to move this program in-house, is that I wanna make sure that we have the bandwidth uh, to uh, uh, meet all these managers and, and making sure that they know that we are available. There. Anyway, I think Mr. Grable was some um, in the queue. Thank, 
Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I would like to just remind the committee about uh, the TIDE initiative and how TIDE fits in with this in that one um, part of the team, the ad advocacy team is working with CFA LA as well as uh, many of our peers in Southern California to put together a conference. Um, hopefully we could do it in the fall of this year. Uh, it would be an inaugural event that Lucero would take the lead on. Uh, so I think that that is one thing that we can do to raise awareness of our various uh, emerging manager um, programs, as well as our diversity, equity, inclusion initiatives. In addition, um, Lucera is active with many advocacy groups. Um, you know, we host them at Lucera. We we participate in various conferences, be it with NEA, with NAS, with um, with AIM, uh, NAIC, uh, with Twigo. Um, one of the things that we're doing is tracking the number of conferences that we speak at, we participate in, and that's something that we will share uh, with the board when we give our annual TIDE update, hopefully for November this year, but it's something that we're keenly focused on is, uh, is raising the awareness of Lacera TIDE, and that should feed into the capital formation pillar of Lacera TIDE, and that's what directly relates to this mandate. Well, thank you for that, Mr. Grable. I really appreciate it because um, I'm interested in um, this program and, and our success because if, if after five years, at least to me, if it shows that we've been successful in this program, uh, then I, be, I will be asking uh, the staff uh, to begin to uh, reevaluate the possibility of doing the private equity uh, emerging manager program in house, but at this at this time, uh, I'm not making the request until I see how this program does. And and so we got a couple more years to do that. But um, anyway, so that's my point. Any other questions um, from the colleagues? Comments. Okay, I will entertain a motion to refer this matter for approval by, to the Board of Investments. Make a motion so that we uh, go ahead and recommend this particular proposal to the Board of Investments, full Board of Investments. Thank you, Mr. Jones. I need a second. I'll second that. Okay, and, uh, there's a motion that's been duly seconded. I don't see any further requests to speak. Uh, roll call, please. Mr. Jones? Aye. Mr. Green? Aye. Chair Santos? Aye. The motion passes with the trustees present. Great, thank you very much. Uh, moving forward to item five reports, uh, currency hedging program, uh, Mr. Wright. Good morning again, Mr. Chair, members of the board and the committee. <clears throat> there we go. Um, Back in the November staff and during staff structure review, um, we told the board that we would follow up with a series of presentations. We've done a few so far, and today is the penultimate one on the currency hedge program. So Makito will open us up and talk with you about the importance of the currency hedge program as an investment decision. Staff will follow with a history overview and the performance of Lucera's currency hedge program. And Makita will wrap things up with a peer survey on other currency hedge programs. With that, I will pass it on to Tim and Alina. Thanks, Ted. I'll kick us off on the next slide and talk about um, just a brief introduction to currency hedging overall before passing it on to staff to talk a little bit more in depth about um, Lacero's currency hedging program. In general, investing in foreign assets can improve the diversification profile for investors, but this also comes at the expense of introducing currency risk. And Lacero acknowledges um, foreign currency as a risk in, their, in your investment policy statement, as well as annual financial reports. Next slide, please. First, why should investors care? Um, at a high level, currency risk is the result 
of purchasing assets denominated in a foreign currency. So that requires you to convert your dollars into foreign currency at the prevailing exchange rate. And then when those assets are sold, the proceeds then need to be converted um, back into dollars at a new prevailing rate. So that difference in these former rates, former and latter rates can cause volatility and volatility can affect return. And over the long term, we do think that the fluctuation of foreign and home currencies can balance out. But this chart below does illustrate how the volatility of a currency can vary both um, just by country and over the years. Next slide, please. Can I ask a quick question, um, Ms. Yoon? Um, so you look at um, in the previous uh, slide, you have the Mexican peso, and then you have the uh, Brazilian real. Uh, the, the, is, is it true that the Mexican peso is more stable than the Brazilian real? in terms of fluctuation in, in, in price? At least over this time period, that's the case. Uh, I think if you looked at a longer history, you'd see some other episodes where um, you might see sharper volatility in the Mexican peso, but uh, over this time period, that's the case. Great, thank you very much. Sorry, Ms. Yuan. No problem. So when we think about currency hedging as an investment decision, there are a couple of different factors, factors to take a look at, whether or not you want to hedge that residual risk from investing in um, foreign assets. And the five uh, major factors are listed on this slide here, and I'll, I'll briefly overview each of them. Next slide, please. First is thinking about your foreign currency outlook. You know, what are your outlooks on, on the prospective returns of these foreign currencies? Assessing how you think the US and foreign exchange rates will stack up against one another can ultimately influence um, your, your hedging, your currency hedging as either a strategic or a tactical position. Um, the second is thinking about the size of your currency exposure. So obviously the larger allocation you have to foreign investments and the more currency risk that you may have in the portfolio. And there may be um, a threshold at which you're not comfortable accepting that much foreign currency risk. Next slide, please. Third, and, and also very importantly, is the cost and the cost of transactions. Um, this graph here lists the cost of carry. It's essentially the cost of hedging currency exposure, um, the difference between the, the US short-term interest rate differential and um, a foreign country's currency. And as you can see in this graph, less liquid currencies such as emerging markets, which is represented by that green line, can have higher costs associated than developed markets such as the blue line as represented by EFA. Next slide, please. The fourth consideration is thinking about um, different types of foreign assets that are in, are in your portfolio and how that may affect either bonds or equities. The chart on your bottom left is comparing bonds. Here you're looking at um, the hedged and unhedged versions of the FTSE World Government Bond Index, and then we're comparing that to um, correlations of the U.S. Barclays Ag. And here we can see that for foreign bonds, even though the currency drives the majority of a foreign bonds volatility, when you hedge a foreign bond, it usually reduces those diversification benefits for that bond. So now your foreign bond almost behaves a little bit more like a US bond, which you can see um, just in that blue line reaching closer to the correlation of one at the top. On the other hand, when you look at the right hand, the bottom right hand graph, when you're comparing equities, um, specifically hedge and unhedge versions of the MSCI EFA and emerging markets, and comparing that to correlations at the S&P 500, we see less of a noticeable difference. So that makes hedging equities a bit more attractive from a diversification standpoint. Next slide, please. And then the fifth consideration is just to consider what percentage of your investments you're even looking to hedge. That can go from the bottom of 0% hedge ratio, hedging none at all, um, all the way to a full hedge ratio of 100% or something in the middle of the fairway at 50%. And currently we do in 50%, is that true? Correct. Okay. And uh, next slide, please. 
And finally, after considering all of those five steps, and let's say you decide to move forward with that currency hedging program, then of course, there's also these different implementation options, which can range all the way from in-house currency management to even um, active currency management. And active currency ten can tend to even be less focused on hedging, but even more focused on capturing those currency returns. But generally speaking, we find that passive management is, is pretty widely used and also the least expensive. Ms. Sanchez, you want to ask the question right now or when she finish? When she's completed. All right, thank you. Okay, I think that completes my slides. I have one more slide on page 10. It's just a summary, but um, I think I reviewed everything. So happy to take the comment or question now. Sure, can you go back to page seven, please? So one of the challenges um, to investing in foreign bond markets it is more often than not the majority, the vast majority of, of kind of the uh, risk that you take into your portfolio comes from the currency transaction, not from the bonds themselves. Um, and, and it is kind of traditionally seen as uh, a risk mitigation strategy to hedge out that uh, foreign currency exposure in the bond portfolio in order to keep the, the sort of, let's call it the, the, <laughs> the safer segment of the portfolio from becoming highly risky because of currency transactions. Um, on the other hand, uh, when you look at um, equity portfolios, because equities themselves carry such significant uh, volatility the process of currency hedging them could actually create a lot of churn and excess costs, especially as you go into the higher cost currencies to, for, for hedging purposes like emerging markets. And so some of the, 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 <laughs> the conclusion you come to is a little counterintuitive uh, versus the role that these play and the potential costs associated. Um, with the hedging process, just the more volatile, the underlying. And if you're trying to keep that currency hedge at a certain place, you could spend a lot of money just churning, buying and selling the same currency because the underlying is moving around. Can you respond to uh, that comment? I, I would say that's a fair point. And that's why the implementation on the equity side is done through a passive uh, overlay that basically resets on a monthly basis is my understanding of how that program is administered. So it doesn't have that component of churn. It's just a, a look through at exposures, a passive hedge, um, and then a reset. So as opposed True. to- True, but um, Tim, even on, yeah. even on a monthly basis, you're still importing quite a bit of volatility and meaning just, meaning the costs of those, even doing a monthly passive overlay I, I, you have to ask the question, how much are you getting versus how much are you paying for the insurance of, of being able to know how that segment of the portfolio is working? And also my understanding is that um, equity managers who are managing their, um, you know, their, their own underlying exposures um, it, it are cognizant of, of, of what is happening, not that their currency, uh, uh, you know, not that that's primary to their decision-making. Um, but but what, what occurs there is um, often considered as, as part of the risk that you're taking with the investments that you're making. But I'll, I'll let John, I can see John is itching to add to that conversation. Yeah, before I, I ask Mr. Grable to make a comment, uh, I, I don't get the impression I could be wrong and Mr. Grable can correct me, which is to, to Ms. Sanchez's point, I don't have the impression that's the reason why we only hedge 50% of the portfolio. Oh, Mr. Grable? Well, I was going to add thank you, uh, Mr. Chair uh, and Ms. Sanchez. Uh, for the public equity portfolio, we only hedge developed market currencies. We don't hedge uh, EM currency for precisely that reason. Uh, and as it relates to fixed income, uh, that's done at the manager level. Um, just because it really is um, a part and parcel of the implementation of a fixed income portfolio is the currency. So we're in absolute agreement. And, and why does uh, do we only uh, hedge fifty percent of the portfolio? What's the rationale behind it? Uh, the the rationale 
Uh, and once the, I, I think a decision was made by the board back in 2009 or so. And I think it was um, that that was a, a good marker to get a sufficient benefit of the diversification uh, or, or the, the, the um, to offset some of the, the potential volatility that that was a sufficient amount uh, for Lacera. But, but someone who was at Lacera back in 2009 or so may have better insight as to as to uh, mine. Well, I, rather than go, I know Mr. McCord is on, uh, on the queue, but before I let you go, Mr. Grable, um, so um, you had had the opportunity to see how well the program has done up to this point with just 50%. It's, is there a recommendation to go up to 100% or where, where are you with the rest of this? Uh, I think that the program has worked. It's been a tremendous tailwind when the board implemented it um, as a result of the movement in the dollar. Uh, instead of a tailwind, we may, not that um, um, uh, predicting markets, but it may be somewhat more of a headwind going forward. It's been a, a headwind. You know, We put the number in the monthly CIO report for the uh, inception to date uh, cumulative cash flows. It was a, about a billion dollars of gain since the beginning earlier in the year. Now it's about 800 million or so of gain. Um, it may be a, you know, a period where it's more volatile and more of a headwind, yet it still may have the benefit of, of reducing the volatility of the equity portfolio. But, but I don't have a, a recommendation today. We can come back with a recommendation. I think one of the things that's important for us as we think about the strategic asset allocation is to maybe unbury this from our equity returns and have it front and center for the board um, as a separate accounting line, just such that we're more aware of all our overlays and hedges. I appreciate that. Mr. McCord? Thanks. Uh, I just wanted to highlight, um, while I wasn't uh, around in 2009 at Lacera, the 50% the um, hedge ratios um, uh, likely came from uh, academic research that has shown that uh, the, the theoretical maximum benefit of currency hedging is for equity portfolios is around um, 50%. Uh, so it's not, it's not an unusual number uh, to see. And I, I would just echo uh, John's comment. Uh, the, your, your fund has benefited tremendously from the hedging program historically, uh, but just as the, the dollar strengthening over the last decade has helped you, uh, if we're just as likely to see the dollar weakening over the next decade. And so it's, um, it's an asset class with more or less a 0% expected return and um, some volatility with it. There are some interesting uh, uh, defensive characteristics to it when the markets go haywire, um, which are nice. But um, as I think uh, Alina may get to later in this presentation, most long-term uh, pension plans uh, today have, um, have backed away from systemic currency hedging in the way that Lacera has done historically. Mm -hmm. Thank you, thank you for that. Uh, Mr. Moseridian was here uh, when this program was adopted by the board. So it will be great to hear from you. Mr. Moseridian. Thank you, thank you, Chair Santos. Yes, I wanted to provide some historical perspective. The 50% the um, uh, hedge ratio was in fact, as Mr. McCourt said, based on the concept of minimizing regret uh, basically, it reduces the risk that when you're wrong, uh, how, how wrong you are. So uh, it recognizes that no one has a crystal ball. I mean, this is really an, actually an academic uh, concept, minimizing re uh, regret. So it, it's a risk reduction uh, objective. Great, and you're happy you. to pull up the, the memo from 2009 if you're interested. Uh, no, I just wanted uh, to look forward and, and to see whether this program is still viable and and uh, um, like everything else, we always need to be to, uh, ready to review all, all programs to see whether or not there's still a benefit. That's it. Um, I don't want to go back to the past. Any other comments? 
Um, I'll, I'll belay my comments. Um, I think Vache took, took the words out of my mouth because I was going to talk about minimum regret. Um, but I wanted to do a quick time check, Mr. Chair. I see we're at six minutes to the hour. I, I, I wanted to see what your flexibility was for the remainder of the presentation. Um, is, is Mr. Knox? Uh, sure, I, I think we're fine on time. Our, our agenda this morning is um, full, but not, not super packed. So how much time would you like, Mr. Wright? Uh, I think we... I think we can be done within the six minutes, but I just wanted to be okay. cognizant of not running. No, I appreciate it. Yeah, and then we'll take a few minutes just to reset in between this and uh, BOI. So go ahead. Great. Thank you, Mr. Max. Okay. Maybe Jeff can jump in. Yes, please. Uh, thanks, Ted, and, and thanks, Alina. Uh, the next three slides provides history, overview, and performance of Lacera's currency hedge program. Um, just to echo previous conversations, uh, the program was implemented in August of 2010 after the board approved the program's objective in 2009. The goal of the program is to dampen currency return volatility associated with increased non-US equity exposures at the time. Uh, BlackRock currently manages a passive currency hedge program for the global equity portfolio, but only on the uh, developed markets, providing a 50% hedge back to the US dollar of the non-US currency exposure in accordance with the currency way outlined in footnote one. Staff and Makita reviewed the program in 2017 and last year the board affirmed the currency hedge program in the global equity structure review. Next slide, please. This slide provides an overview of the currency hedge program. I'll highlight a couple of key points. First, the program is passively managed, meaning that there's no directional currency bets. Uh, we don't hedge the emerging market exposure um, as discussed previously due to the high trans uh, transaction costs. Uh, the program is implemented using currency forward contracts and the exposures are rebalanced on a monthly basis. And lastly, compliance and risk monitoring are reviewed on a monthly basis covering counterparty exposure, forward contract maturity and realized gain and loss. Moving on to the performance on the next slide. Uh, looking at the top chart, which shows the program's historical performance, you can see that the program's return closely tracks the benchmark return with minimal tracking errors of five basis points. The chart on the bottom shows the historical volatility chart and compares the um, program's efficiency, uh, efficacy, uh, looking at the hedge versus non-hedge, non-US uh, composite. Um, the program has met its objective of reducing return volatility as measured by standard deviation. Notice that the standard deviation for non-US equity hedge returns are lower compared to the unhedged returns across multiple periods. In addition, as of March, Lacera has received approximately $793 million in cash flow from gains on monthly currency forward settlements since the program's inception. This is also reported uh, to the board in the monthly CIO report. Now I'll turn it over back to Alina and Tim to cover Makita's peer survey on currency hedge program. Great, thank you. Uh, I apologize if there's some background noise. There's someone outside of our office today trimming the hedges right at this moment. So um, hopefully that won't be too large of a distraction. The main thing I wanted to highlight here is the peer surveys, as we already spoke about briefly, uh, about 50% of what we would call your peer plans utilize a currency hedge program. If we reround this a couple of years, you would see a higher number. So there has been a trend over the last couple, especially for larger size plans to move away from it and just simply accept the currency risk. Uh, but this, this sort of middle of the fairway is still to utilize a program like this. Um, so we didn't wanna have a, an affirmative recommendation on this. This is just to review the overall program and this is just to present our overall findings here. We're more than happy to dig into each of these underlying plans if you're so interested, um, but this is how the data played out in this survey. If we could go to the next one, we can just take a look at it from a high level on what the impacts on modeling at the strategic asset allocation level are like. So these are our capital markets expectations for developed market um, programs, both 
hedged and non-hedged. As you can see uh, in the hedge program, you do have somewhat lower expected returns, but the corollary to that uh, is the standard deviation is also somewhat lower. When you turn to the next page, you can see how this plays out in a total evaluation of risk adjusted returns in the sharp ratio, um, where you do get some benefit from lowering the volatility relative to the level of risk that you're taking uh, as you implement a hedge in a program. But I would also call this within the realm of false precision when you look at it on a total portfolio basis, you're talking about slight movements in the second decimal point. So again, from a total fund impact perspective, um, to Ms. Sanchez's points, there are complexities, there are costs that come with some of these benefits and the benefits may only just be marginal. So with that, I think we'll stand for any additional questions. Any additional comments, questions? See none. Um, thank you for the for the report. And um, items for staff review. There are no items at this time. Uh, go to the order. Can you do a roll call, please? Mr. Kehoe. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. I have nothing. Ms. Greenwood. Good morning, everybody. Uh, I have nothing either. Mr. Jones. Uh, I have nothing, thank you. Mr. Green. I am glad we're in the middle of the fairway. Thank you for the presentation, it's very helpful. Chair Santos. Uh, nothing, thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Jones for the, moving those motions today, appreciate it. That's it for me. Okay, I will turn to the motion to adjourn. So moved. Thank you. Mr. Knox, uh, five more minutes. Hold on. Sure. Thank you, Mr. Santos. We'll start at 9.07 a.m. Thank you, sir. <laughs>